Good evening. Welcome to this lecture, which is part of the Australian Tapestry Workshop's International Speaker Series, Cloth Culture, an online series of lectures featuring contemporary artists who utilise textiles to communicate complex narratives about their cultural heritage. My name is Caroline Johnston and I'm the convener of the Friends of the Tapestry Workshop. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the Bunurung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians and the land from which I'm Zooming this evening. I'd also like to pay respect to their elders past, present and future and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. Behind me is a progress photo of the current commission being woven at the, the workshop, the Parramatta Tapestry, designed by Chris Kenyon, commissioned for the Walker Corporation in Sydney and which has two project leaders, Chris Koshis and Pamela Joyce. It's wonderful and if you have a chance to get down there, do to have a look at how it's getting on. Now to tonight. We uh, will be speaking with artist Abubakar Fafana. Abubakar is a multidisciplinary artist and designer known for his work in preserving and reinvigorating West African tax textile and indigo dyeing techniques. He is one of the world's foremost practitioners of fermented indigo vat dyeing and mineral mud dye techniques. Born in Mali and raised in France, Abubakar uses materials from the natural world and his artistic practices revolve around the cycles of nature, the themes of birth, decay and change, and the impermanence of these materials. His professional life is dedicated to preserving the traditions of fermented indigo dyeing, along with other West African textile techniques and indigenous materials. Abu Bakal will be pleased to answer your questions at the end of his talk. If you would like to ask a question during the talk, please send them through by clicking the Q&A button. Also, we would love to know where you are uh, in the world tonight. And if you could post in the chat function where you are, we, we will hopefully share those through the evening. We will try and answer as many questions as possible at the end of the lecture. Now, I'd like to welcome Abubakar to speak. I know that you welcome me in joining, um, in, in joining us tonight. Welcome to our international speaker series. Abubakar, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. And uh, thank you everyone for being uh, part of this um, conversation. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. I feel uh, really honored to be here and uh, sharing a part of my passion with you all. And uh, yeah, to talk about myself, uh, my name is Abu Bakar Fofana. I'm, uh, fiber artist, if I can say, or artist maker or designer maker. And uh, I'm um, originally from Mali, West Africa, and I'm also French. And uh, yes, my uh, work is uh, you know, involved in uh, trying, I would say, to sustain uh, West African uh, textile uh, tradition. Was something was disappearing uh, slowly, I can say. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my material and my process before even I, I get to the outcome of uh, this material and this, um, and this process. And also the medium I'm going to talk about today is uh, indigo. Uh, I'm a, I can say I'm a natural dyer, but most of my uh, work is using natural dyes. And of course, indigo have uh, something special, uh, special place in my, uh, in my life because it's been um, kind of a lifetime commitment. Uh, I did not come to this, uh, to this uh, substance, if I have to call it substance, instead of uh, color because it's much more than the color. And I'm always trying to see behind the blueness um, of, the, of indigo. So I've been involved uh, or I've been introduced to indigo at my uh, childhood, I would say. Yes, my childhood, I was seven years old when I first uh, discovered indigo it's, uh, as a medicinal plant, not at all as dye plant. So, I'm the grandchild of a wonderful woman. My grandmother who was a herbalist using um, nature, the natural world and plants to heal her, her patient. And uh, she also was the one who would commission us 
to go and collect uh, plants in the bush for her to use. And uh, yes, that's how I came uh, across to this uh, substance, uh, indigo. So, and uh, the magic for the child of, of seven years old child was uh, how from green leaves we can make blue. So I think this is the seeding in my mind and uh, we've been since then uh, uh, the passion, the, the passion I'm, I'm still growing. And uh, I can say working with this medium uh, after even th three decades, I'm still learning. And this is also something I have to say. And um, yeah, so maybe I can start uh, this um, presentation. And of course, I will uh, happily answer all the questions you have. And of course, we are limited on time, in time. And uh, so, okay, um, uh, I will start sharing my screen. Uh, okay, oh, sorry. So, yes, coming to to, indic to to starting my presentation with uh, with plants, of course, and because um, in my own belief and um, in my tradition, you know, the most of the time, child will go through initiatory society to learn about their own traditions. And um, one of the most important things in this uh, West African tradition or in uh, uh, Malian tradition is uh, agriculture. And uh, we said that uh, the most important action humans on this earth should, uh, should do firstly is um, learning how to sustain themselves, how to to make things possible to, to be able to feed themselves. And in this Malian society, in the first initiatory society, kids go after seven years old, is, uh, is they learn the art of agriculture. This is uh, really the most important things. And we have something very important, um, say Dali or Dani, it means, it means sowing seeds on the earth. And this is the same word we use for creation and procreation. So just to let you know how important is this action of uh, growing and uh, because humans find all their substance in, in the earth, of course. And uh, most of the time we say, yes, we love nature, but uh, I would say I'm nature myself and I have to be aware all the time that I'm just part of this ecosystem and it's not only about human beings, but for all the living beings, plants and animals include, of course. So, and in this, uh, in our cosmology or cosmogony, I don't know how to say, uh, this fiber is a, a cultural product. We can even say that a cultural product because of, uh, Mali is the biggest cotton producer in African continent, or the first, the number one producer, if I have to say like that. And we call this fiber the white gold of Mali, the cotton. And in our, our cosmology or cosmogony, uh, this uh, cotton seed been brought to humans by a celestial birds who brought the, the seeds for agriculture at and the cotton seed was part of those seeds. And um, these celestial birds uh, brought the, 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 this raw material and human learn how to grow it. And then through the observation of uh, a spider, uh, we human also by observing that spider have learned how to weave the fiber. And, uh, and the, the same bird was 
was uh, the, the the one who also showed to human to to spin to spin the this fiber. So just to say that uh, cotton is very very important in this uh, West African culture and especially in this uh, Malian culture. So and it's impossible for me to talk about myself without talking about uh, my material and uh, my medium because i cannot disconnect myself um, from both this material and this and the process because without that my work would never exist so and um, i'm working in on different fields if i can say that and this is um, a native uh, colored cotton we have abandoned now because of uh, use be, been called uh, the dirty cotton and is also a short staple and um, most of the cotton we are growing now is for textile industry and we are not even uh, transforming that cotton and as the first producer of cotton in west Af in the african continent we don't transform even one percent of this cotton everything is exported and then come back uh, to to africa in um, a kind of, uh, I would say, finished products. So this um, cotton is really amazing. And what I'm doing in my work is also is uh, working with a group of um, spinners, women mostly, because uh, they have the, the skill and the knowledge of uh, using this uh, very uh, traditional tool we can call the drop spindle. And um, it's a, a kind of cottage industry. I'm taking the raw cotton and sending to the village. Uh, and uh, it's been then spun by women. And all the process, of course, is uh, very uh, labor intensive and time consuming because you can see the tools that are very simple tools. The way they take the cotton seed off, uh, separate the cotton seed from the fiber uh, with this metallic stick and then it's hand cards and uh, and then yeah hand spun on uh, with this uh, drop spindle okay this is uh, one of the the first um, process uh, when uh, i have the cotton to 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 have the the cotton uh, being uh, spun by uh, the by the the women, and you can see those bobbins, and it takes um, several months for me to get uh, the raw material back, because uh, all this work is done in a very specific period of the year, and uh, I cannot. Uh, ask uh, those women to like uh, saying that I need uh, 20 or 30 kilo per month or of, of and uh, I will just leave them the time to do whatever they can do and me to collect what's what's available because even just one bobbin like that it can take um, over a month to have one kilo for a spinner to to get and then I'm processing that uh, cotton when I receive them by putting them on skein and dyeing them and uh, and uh, or also the bobbin is sent to the other another community of weavers to just do the the narrow bands. Uh, you must know that in West Africa we have the specificity of uh, working with a horizontal loom and we make a narrow bands those narrow bands then are stitched together to make larger and uh, I'm the one who's providing of course to the weavers uh, all the, the, the yarns, the skeins, dyed or undyed to be able also to get um, this raw material, the role of, uh, we call it finimu, of raw material and from this role I can then uh, stitch the band together to have a larger panel for my work and um, to make uh, anything I need to make, of course, so no matter if it's, uh, uh, can I say, uh, 
installation, painting, uh, fashion accessories, homewares. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, the riches. And I do believe that uh, when we say traditionally that uh, this is uh, white gold, and um, yeah, you are very rich with, from this white gold as well. Yeah. So that's, uh, that was the fiber. And um, it's a, a kind of a duality for me always. When I say duality, it's like uh, things who are, cannot be sep separate because uh, fiber always go with dyes. And it's like uh, life and death and, uh, you know, so or feminine, masculine, you know, those, uh, those duality are very important in uh, um, all my work, of course, because uh, without those, uh, those things going together, nothing can exist. So, um, as I was saying that I'm a grandson of a herbalist, I don't know much of, um, I know a little bit, I would say, <laughs> about the therapeutic purpose of uh, many of those plants, but um, my, uh, my concern being more how I can extract colors or from, um, from those plants. And the Indigofera erecta is uh, one of the native plants native to Africa continent. And um, this is uh, for many years now, I'm also part of uh, a farming process with a community in, in, in Bamako, I mean, near Bamako, one hour drive from Bamako. And we are growing uh, not only, of course, dyes, but many other uh, dye plants and uh, reforestation and medicinal plants, of course. But um, one of the two species of uh, indigo plant we are growing is indigo ferrarecta. This one is uh, small leaves. And uh, this one called Philoneptera sienescent. This is the one when I was a child, I've been introduced to indigo plants. And um, you can see those, uh, this is a very different species, a very different uh, leaves form, and this is much bigger leaves. And the fascinating things during this uh, time when I discovered how green leaves can make blue, it was just by crushing these leaves in my finger, in my hand, and when the sap oxidized, your, the hand turned blue right away. And that was a kind of magic, you know? And uh, yes, then how blue, green can make blue. That was, uh, that was uh, all about that. Trying to understand this um, alchemy or not even saying it is magic. So, and uh, the indigo farm in Mali is growing those two species. And uh, the way we process uh, that plant is uh, when we, we collect the leaves, uh, traditionally uh, to rework with uh, the fermented leaves vats. And the, the leaves are quite uh, bulky, but the genius of the ancestor is that they thought by um, reducing the, the mass of the leaves, we could create a concentration of uh, a chemical component, you know, because the, those leaves contain what we call the indigo precursor. That's why at the right beginning, we see green leaves, but um, by uh, pounding those leaves, we reduce the mass of, um, of uh, the leaves matter and we create this concentration. And you can see just uh, through the oxidation, um, the, 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 the green leaves will turn blue or even very dark blue. And this is another amazing riches from this, uh, this country as well, the blue gold in this time. After the white gold, we have the blue gold. So the indigo balls we are making are very, very precious. And because of the ratio to get, um, to have one kilo of dried leaves to 
uh, when you you before you start uh, setting uh, the fermentation vat. So the ratio is uh, 10 kilo of uh, fresh leaves will give you more or less uh, one kilo of uh, dried rolls. So, and um, with the, the vat I'm using in my studio here are 350 liters. And I'm using 20 kilo of, uh, of dried balls to start my vats. So you can imagine if even I have to use uh, 200 kilos of fresh leaves, my, uh, my vat cannot even contain this amount of leaves. So that's why the processing is also very important. And then um, we get uh, this uh, raw dried material, the indigo balls to set um, the fermentation leaves vat. And um, this vat is um, a living vat because when making indigo is a growing bacteria, and uh, those bacteria are the one who would with the, with the contact with oxygen will turn solid and blue to make the indigo tin. So this is the alchemy of uh, natural indigo. And uh, here you can see this vat with this uh, thick and purplish foam on the top who shows that there is life inside and there is movement or life inside this, uh, this vat. And uh, it's uh, one of the most important signs that the indigo vat should give you, you know, this um, very uh, dark purplish color and at, on the surface of your vat. And it means also all the, the reaction is happening, the reduction being well done. And uh, this sign is always amazing to see before working with the vat. And the technique itself will take a minimum one week, 10 days before the vat gets ready through the fermentation process and then for the dyer to start working with this vat. And um, because we are dealing with living organism, and in our belief also, when I say our belief is a animist belief, we, we think that everything was alive will also die. And um, this, I'm showing a vat of uh, 14 months old. And uh, you can see the, the characteristic of the, the foam here. The foam is very loose and very pale, not anymore as uh, dark as the, the, the previous uh, picture I was showing. And, but it doesn't mean that uh, it's, 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 it's finished, but life is still going. And I would say the skill of an indigo dyer working with the fermenta fermentation leaves vat is not so especially succeeding the recipe to get a beautiful vat to start with, but the skill of the dyer is um, knowing the conditions and knowing how healthy is your living organism every single day and to be able to afford their needs or to fulfill their needs and for them to have long life. And um, that's why it's a very complex uh, technique because uh, everything in this uh, liquid form should be uh, really kind of uh, pure. The water you are using should be a good quality water, very, very important. And um, because uh, about the chemical uh, aspect, um, the pH in the indigo vat is uh, alkali. Um, ideally between 10.5 to 11 pH. And uh, you have also to make this condition uh, exist in, inside the, the vat. And um, of course, anytime you are dipping your fiber inside this liquid and the taking out, it means you are taking off more bacteria. And uh, at the end of your day it's also necessary to feed those bacteria uh, they have a specific diet you can uh, feed them with um, fermented agents uh, we use many different things for for that like also uh, things will contain uh, fermenting agent contain also fructose 
for the bacteria to be kind of uh, strong and and uh, and healthy. Uh, we we feed our bat here it could be uh, wheat bran porridge, it could be uh, ripe banana or tamarind pulp, it could be mango mango pulp. I mean, all those things are very important to to bring and um, in inside the bats and of course let them rest for two or three days three days to give the time to those living organisms to regenerate. So that's why most of the time you will hear that uh, natural indigo is a living color or we say living blue. So because those uh, this alchemy also needs all this to happen and uh, and this is how you can you, you can get to use the vat for a long time. And uh, something I have to say was also very, um, it seemed very uh, contradictory because uh, the most challenging shade you can achieve is uh, indigo vats are the light, uh, lightest colors. It's much more challenging to achieve a light color than the dark colors. Because at the beginning of its life cycle, the vats uh, are very strong and it's very easy by layering, by uh, uh, multiple immersion, immersion to get uh, very dark shades very quite so quickly. But this is uh, difficult when you, get, you want to achieve light shade. And what's important also for me to say that uh, indigo have this richness in terms of shade. It's not only a midnight um, dark blue as we have in mind most of the time. And um, in our tradition, we have uh, um, so as you see, you know the, the the white fabric coming out from the indigo vat is look like this kind of uh, yellowish, and will turn greenish and then blue through the oxidation process. So, uh, yeah, by rinsing in the clear water, of course. You will see the, the color, the purity of the color reveal. And uh, of course, in, um, in my studio, and uh, I'm working with the team, and we work all on peace dyeing and also on uh, yarn dyeing, which was a very important part of our process. And this is um, those skin then we share with the weavers to, to make. Um, their work and the uh, dyeing yarn is also a very specific uh, uh, process uh, no matter any fiber who go into the dye vat should be scarred and clean to remove all the the, the starch or or wax or grease if it's animal fiber and then um, to be then uh, dyed in uh, in the vat so this is um, also a very interesting uh, process and way of uh, of dyeing dyeing yarns. And uh, I was talking about the richness um, of uh, the indigo shades, and um, I have to say in my own traditions, uh, in the classic society, as we said. Uh, to be an accomplished in indigo dyer, you will have to be able to achieve these um, 12 shades. 12 shades, and because we said that each of them is a, a, a specific emotion, and um, you can see from the, the bottom to the top, uh, all those uh, shades can be achieved in, um, in, um, in, in the indigo vat. So maybe the, the first ones are the most challenging one. And most of the time you get those one at the life cycle of the vat. That's what seems contradictory, you know, because uh, uh, traditionally we, we, we believe that uh, the life cycle also is of the indigo, uh, indigo vat is uh, nine months. And we often do this parallel with human gestation. Uh, but so, uh, through my experience, or I can 
take those this um, this life cycle longer and the maximum time will be was uh, 14 months for me and it's, it's really of course uh, challenging to get um, to that level and what i i think it's really interesting is uh, like uh, this um, the, the the first shade we i can translate um, bagafu by the blue of nothingness is can be achieved only at the life cycle of uh, that you know you know the last breath of the of the vat will give you in several in multiple dips uh, this blue of nothingness <clears throat> so the the richness of uh, of uh, the indigo is one of the things um, i spent years trying to understand this alchemy and um, to be able to uh, extract the maximum from uh, from those vats of course at the end of the life cycle of the vats the vats uh, is uh, is uh, then uh, collected to be thrown on the on the field because it's an amazing fertilizer with many good things in inside and uh, we give back to the earth what the earth been given to us and then the the cycle continue and uh, here is uh, on a very fine linen is what i can call the blue of nothingness and those are the most challenging colors to achieve and um, of course as i was saying our studio we work on different uh, different products uh, in terms of design by uh, trying to give the maximum of the shades we can depending the the product we are making of course and um, i will say no matter if it's a functional textile as i used to call that or non-functional because they are both art for me and uh, that's why it's difficult sometimes uh, to to say or we, or i would say or to put words in what you are doing and um, who we, we are and what we are doing so this uh, shawl for example is uh, from uh, dyed and spun yarns and uh, it could be from piece dyeing or yarn dyeing this is uh, what we can call the ombre degradé dye on linen and um, tie resist on hemp stitch resists on the uh, narrow band finimugu west african cotton i mean malian cotton narrow bands stitch resist some collaboration with fashion designer for both accessories and garments that was for a brand uh, called uh, eden who's owned by um, um bono musician and his wife uh, and i had uh, a collaboration with them a few years ago for new york fashion week uh, and the collection was uh, using natural indigo and i had a second collection using other dyes than indigo like mud mud dyeing but this is not the purpose of today and the uh, homewares using narrow bands um, stitch really so and uh, yarn dyed and then woven this is just a uh, plain uh, finimugu narrow bands stitched with uh, hand stitched with uh, yarn dyed in, in the hole. so and then i would say in in my uh, in my work there is also this uh, environmental issue i'm um, I have to to formulate because, um, and I do think that uh, my work is uh, completely connected to the land, to nature, and I even, you know, most of the time, like uh, photographing my uh, work in in the nature than um, on the white holes. But anyway, so uh, in my personal work. 
I also use, as I have said, I'm, I'm a fiber addict. I'm, I'm, I'm using many uh, different uh, fiber, but um, I like always the interaction uh, of my work with the natural world um, or natural landscape. And um, <clears throat> yeah. And for me, it's give the more sense to who I am and what I'm doing, you know, and how I myself uh, connect with my uh, my own work. Because, uh, as I have said, I can't disconnect myself from all my material, my process. So I'm I'm, I'm kind of part of my own work. I don't know how to to express that, but um, and I think. There is much more resonance. I don't know if that's what English I mean more. Yeah, with the natural world always. And of course, uh, working with this medium, and um, I'm most of the time coming to talk about uh, the different death of uh, of indigo, and uh, of course we did uh, talk about uh, the medicinal purpose of the plant used, uh, for example, by my grandmother as an antiseptic and anti-inflammatory. But uh, we also have, um, we can talk about the political death of uh, this substance, because uh, for me, I cannot work with indigo without having in mind that indigo also um, has been uh, a symbol of uh, oppression. When I say a symbol of oppression, I'm talking about, um, you know, the enslavement of uh, West African in the United States, for example, with uh, the exploitation of a human being by other human being. And I think uh, we should never forget, you know, we should, we should always have in memory that's happened even not so long ago. And for example, this picture remind me and of, um, I mean, it was also done in the way I was thinking at this, uh, as this beautiful song has been sung by many artists, but um, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, Nina Simone's version, Strange Fruits. I don't know if you know about um, the lyrics of uh, Strange Fruits. In, um, during the 50s, all this uh, lynching of uh, African American in the United States, uh, you know, by being hanged, uh, and I mean, it's it's a very emotional thing. Anytime I and I start talking about it, but uh, just to remind that um, Africans been enslaved in in, uh, in the United States and to work on in both cotton field and the indigo field, and the indigo have been uh, one of the main cash crop. And uh, of course, those slaves have been enslaved to these, these people have been enslaved to fuel uh, the American economy and uh, capitalism been built on that. And, uh, and yeah, this is, uh, as a visual artist, I think uh, this is um, things we should, uh, I mean, for me, uh, you know, so it's maybe I'm, I'm, I'm trying to not be emotional about that, but uh, it's uh, something very important to be aware of. So, and yeah, I was saying that I like always the interaction of my work with the natural world because indigo suit with mineral, really. And, um, and our belief is that, um, you know, we are part of this ecosystem. And uh, no matter is uh, is animate or non-animate, like stones here, and I think it always gives the the really sense to my work. And that's um, installation I start working on, but never did not exist yet, is um, uh, talking about uh, migration, and because we have this. Uh, common story or history, I don't know how to say, with uh, our colonial power, with France, 
And you must know what's happening, that um, this young generation more and more are trying to, to cross the Mediterranean Sea to go to Europe. And of course, they are not welcomed by the, by the Europeans. And the tragic thing is that uh, many of them uh, every single day are being swallowed by the sea because uh, their dream been stolen from their rulers and who, who, did not, who don't, doesn't give them any hope. And they, do be, they think that by uh, you know, crossing the Mediterranean, getting to Europe, they will find a kind of promise, promised land. But anyway, this is another subject uh, we could talk about. So this is um, a project, uh, interior design projects um, I've done several years ago. And again, this is by the Niger River, not so far from uh, Bamako. With a mosquito net tent so made in linen gauze. This is the same project, but uh, exhibited in a fair, uh, interior design fair with a um, bed cover and uh, pillows all made um, from uh, organic hand spun cotton narrow bands. So I think um, time is running and I have to shorter my. Um, yeah, so those are what I can call the outcome of uh, my material and my process. And, um, but I have to say one thing, like uh, my grandmother would say that uh, indigo is uh, a great plant and uh, from indigo we can make a blue color, but there is something more important even that the plant have to give is the soul for her to be able to heal both the human body and, and spirit. So of course, indigo is a beautiful color, but I have still to come back to the fact that uh, it's coming from a plant. And when we hear indigo, we always have to keep in mind that is a plant source blue. Because this is not obvious in the nature that uh, if it's not a mineral or maybe some flower that we could uh, make uh, blue from, uh, from green. So this is a metaphor called the uh, Galairinou, the Les Arbres Bleus in French, or blue trees. I don't know how to say a metaphor for the saying that uh, indigo is from a vegetable origin, not from a mineral origin, like we thought in Europe for a long time because of indigo processed in a pigment form or, or cake form was coming from India. And we thought it was a, a blue, a blue stone like lapis lazuli or turquoise kind of. Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, another project titled Uprising, dedicated to this um, <clears throat> to enslaved people in the United States who had a hard time working in the <clears throat> indigo or cotton plantation and we keep uh, thinking of all this uh, suffering, all this harm, all this uh, torture, all this violence done to them. <clears throat> Sorry. So uprising is, was one of my um, installation in this uh, contemporary art event called Documenta. I had two different projects, the uprising and another one titled Africa Blessing who I did collaborate with uh, living beings, living animals, sheep, to talk about migration. And uh, it's been one of my most controversial work. And uh, if you have questions about it, uh, I'm happy to, to answer to those questions. And I have to say, of course, that uh, I did not harm those animals. And it was a really collaboration. And I have said that uh, my indigo vat is, uh, is using only uh, non-toxic uh, and synthetic uh, product inside. And I have myself, uh, my hand in my, my work all the time. 
and no harm have been done to those animals. But for the purpose of this uh, body of artwork, talking about uh, human movement, migration, and life, it was necessary for me to work with living fiber animal. This is how I have seen that. And it would have been uh, disrespectful to use the dead sheep skin for that work and because it, it was about life and movement anyway. So those are some of the... <clears throat> and uh, the previous sheep was the African sheep who have less hair, less wool than the European ones. And this proje project been done with the Athens University of Agriculture who provide the 54 sheep. Africa Blessing was a 54 sheep. 54 because of 54 country in, in the African continent and one ship per country in Africa. So that was more or less the idea. Of course, I had to dye those 54 ship and uh, not make two of them the same. Of course, that it was all about that. Like uh, Africa have been the big cake shared between the colonial powers. And you can see those straight lines, the borders in this continent. And um, so it was a very sensitive work and uh, a very important work for me as well. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so now I would like to share quickly uh, a small video. Uh, so I don't know how to get out from here, maybe to, to, get, to, the, to get to the video, this small video to finish my presentation. So this small video is uh, <clears throat> after a document I've been uh, the making of my work for documenta. It was mostly, I would say, three different projects. The uprising and Africa blessing with the ship. And also the other project was um, dying uh, 20 kilo of yarns to be uh, woven, to be used as a bookmark, as ribbon for the bookmark, bookmark of the Documenta uh, catalog, one of the Documenta catalog. So I will let you see that with uh, no really comment, and then um, we can, I'm happy to answer all questions. Really hard. Le souvenir d'enfance que j'ai, c'est ça. C'est d'être avec les animaux, les chèvres, les moutons, et puis nous, on cueillir les, les, les feuilles, euh, les fruits sauvages pour se nourrir, et euh, déterrer des racines pour se nourrir. Voilà, et puis tout le monde y trouve tout le monde, aussi bien les animaux qu'on amène hein, pour nourrir que nous-mêmes. Et puis euh, c'est la contemplation de la nature, c'est le chant des oiseaux. Ça, c'est nourrissant. Ça, c'est inspirant. Je trouve que c'est la source d'inspiration la, so, so, la plus réelle. This is uh, during the indigo harvest at the farm. That was the, before was the indigo ferra erecta harvest. And um, then this is a philoneptera cyanescent harvest. And for the uprising, we did grow in a green greenhouse in a, in a castle in Germany, three different species of indigo plants, indigo ferra recta, the polygonum tinctorium, and the isatis tinctoria, who is a European wood, to symbolize the slave plantation of this installation. And also to talk about the universal aspect of uh, this substance, indigo. And uh, some of the lightest shade also been dyed uh, from, uh, uh, how do you say, fresh leaves.
as I have said, light rochets are much more challenging to achieve. And that was the project of uh, the yarn dying for the bookmark in a collaboration with uh, a, a factory in Athens who specialize in uh, passement tree. I don't know how you put our ribbon making. With 10,000 meter of ribbon, very luxury bookmark, I would say, <laughs> catalog of sorry. And that was the, the purpose of this, and in uh, three different shades. And um, this is exactly how we, we process uh, the indigo after we've been harvesting, with a pounding in the, this uh, wood and mortar and vessel. And you can even see right away the change, the color change of the leaves through this process. And uh, to become right away very dark. And here is the blue gold. Those are the 12 shades. Para follow. Para no no kene. Para kene. Para je. Para fin. Para kali. Para jalan. Lumasa. Lumasa je. Lumasa fin. Lumasa duni. And Africa blessing is a flock of 54 sheep. So this is the city of Athens in Greece. Ben ben ben, on a ben fait ben. Tiens, on a 
So that's that's it. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Abubakar, that was just so interesting. Thank you so much. You know, sharing all of those insights into your practice, your team, the country, how how the blue gold, the white gold, it's really, I think we've been really very, very, very um, pleased and grateful to hear all of that and, and, and obviously your concerns around the political and migration aspects as well. I think you've really given us a most wonderful um, idea of your practice in I know a short time, but that's just been fantastic. Thank you so much from everyone who's out there. Thank you, thank you, Caroline. And now we have some questions, so I might jump into those. And uh, where shall I start? Ah, um, did you first show your work in art galleries or as products for sale in a retail ses setting? And how do you find your work translates between the contemporary art and the retail spheres? Well, no, I think um, I first uh, did share my work uh, um, by, uh, I would say, sharing it by, uh, how do you say, by trying to something I did not um, talk about, who is much more important to me than any, how do you say, uh, mercantile aspects. Uh, it was the uh, transmission and the transmission is also still what I'm working on because when I, I came to Indigo it was already a kind of lost tradition in West Africa and uh, I, I am I'm a self-taught person I did not do uh, any design school I have learned through my passion and I have forged all this uh, through this passion but it was important for me to to be able to to work on this transmission of this uh, uh, this tradition we, we, we were losing and uh, I think my work into galleries came very late after decade maybe even I would say of my uh, my personal practice and uh, and uh, it it was not my my goal and because I could make a but at the beginning of living with another Mechi who I was a graphic designer and calligrapher, I had this, um, how can I say, that work. But uh, yes, and my work into galleries or, or yes, or concept store came very late and it was not my goal at all at the beginning. And I still have to yeah, say, I'm yeah, sorry, even I still don't have this these days any gallery representation. And of course, I, I have to find out, but, but I still don't have any gallery representation, which is, uh, is not normal. Anyway. Uh, looking back from now to when you started, do you think your journey in Indigo is as you hoped or, or as you expected from then till now? Uh, yes, I would say in, certain, in a certain way, I can see more interest to it uh, now, and especially uh, because uh, in my own country, you know, people used to to say that I'm crazy because uh, I was uh, sometimes uh, when I started my research on Indigo, you know, going to Dogon country, more North Mali, and uh, working like uh, 70 kilometer uh, a week, like. Uh, 10 kilometers a day to try to find the first seed uh, to, to start growing indigo myself. And they say, why you are, you know, you, you care about such things, you know, you have uh, powder in the market you can buy and in one day you can make maybe, uh, I don't know, 50 wrap skirts. But more and more, of course, people understand why I've been, I, I've been involved in that because it was more for, uh, you know, uh, 
the preservation and keeping alive this uh, lost memory. And of course, in, in the Western world, you know, and there's something I have to say, indigo is absolutely not a fashionable color for me. I, I see something into it more in the timeline, timeless way than, uh, than uh, you know, trendy or fashionable uh, color. So I think, yeah, we are, I, I can see that uh, there is much more interest uh, to, to indigo now than it was, uh, I mean, natural indigo than it was uh, uh, decades ago. And a few questions about Mali. Um, one from Eloise. Clim and thank you. Climate extremities and unpredictability driven by continued burning of fossil fuels are pol posing a huge challenge for people working with crop cycles. Have your patterns of working with the land changed because of this? Yes, a lot. And uh, it's a reality, like uh, global warming is a reality. And uh, I can see those uh, last years, I can say on this, um, on this last decade or even five years ago, and uh, and still we are at the driest season of in Mali now, and uh, we still have um, uh, water as a challenge, and because also in our agriculture did change a lot, because people um, started bringing also more uh, what can I say synthetic fertilizer <coughs> and the pesticide and insecticide all these things are causing a lots of harm. In the, and we can see that uh, more and more our rainy season come very late, and sometimes it, it doesn't, you know, even uh, last uh, the number of months it used to to last. And this is a reality, and we we can see that in other part of the world we have uh, you have a flood, you have uh, I mean things that, and we have to completely change our system. To, to, to fit, and then it's much more challenging, of course. You know, we have uh, big water issues, and we did lost last year uh, lots of uh, small trees, and even this year, because uh, we definitely, uh, we did a lot of reforestation, and young trees are much more fragile when you come to, the, to go through, to go through the dry season. And we, if we cannot water them, for them to get strong enough, to be able to to pass this hard time, it become really really challenging. Yes, I, we see a lot of difference, and we have to adapt our agriculture from um, this uh, global uh, warming now. Thank you. And another question was, what's happening in Mali now? Has your work generated interest in other producers working in indigo locally? So the thing is. Is there is a, a people who are of course interested in what I'm doing, but when it comes to tell them that uh, you know this is a long process, and um, the backup, of course there is many people who pretend doing natural indigo and are just doing synthetic, and it's a problem because when someone come to me and I said okay if you want to be trained by me, uh, it's a minimum seven years, you know. And they say seven years. I say yeah, seven years. And of course, this uh, cycle is um, what traditionally uh, an apprentice will only become a, uh, an artisan only through after seven years in in the when the master was teaching. To and you have some country if you take Japan for example to make this parallel. And uh, an apprentice will never become uh, an artisan. Uh, uh, it will take. 10, 10 years, but this time because we want everything fast, everything quick, and uh, really apprenticeship uh, is uh, something people uh, say they, they don't have time. And I use often to reply, if you have to be a surgeon, you know, you are not going to open someone's belly and, and cut, and, uh, you know, if you did not do the, the time to, to learn how to, you know, in any match, I think, uh, this time is um, is necessary. It's uh, just not, uh, you know, getting through is a commitment. And my my life to Indigo is a commitment. I did not come to Indigo for 10, 10 years or 20 years. And what I was saying after even 38 years of experience, I'm still learning. So how I can give to to them, uh, you know, this knowledge in, um, in one year or in uh, 
you know, three years of what I've been, you know, I've spent uh, decades of learning. So this is, um, there is interest, but um, really few people are doing the genuine things. And that's a pity. And I would like to, that's why also for me, transmission is important here because uh, I have to, to make sure that a new generation will, uh, will take that at another level, you know. Mm, mm. And perhaps a last question. Um, Paula says, I love that the natural indigo process is considered a living brew, as well as referencing connections between the human and non-human life. Do you view your work as ancestor work or what Leila Fagali refers to as plancestors who help us remember or lead lot or not to forget our roots? No, it's, uh, it's completely connected for my ancestors. I exist because of my ancestor. And everything I'm doing now has been done by my ancestor. And my, com my work is uh, completely linked to that. Uh, you know, people find it so often boring when you come to talk about spirituality. You know, in, um, in indigo or this color uh, is, the, is the link between uh, humans and the divine. This is how we see indigo. And that's why also indigo is very important in uh, many of our our uh, important um, time in, in our life, like uh, from the birth, the reason we, we used to host a newborn baby in an indigo dyed fabric was because we do believe that it's a color of protection and uh, also welcoming a newborn baby. It's so showing that, uh, you know, we adults, we have a responsibility towards this uh, new uh, life coming and uh, and indigo is really present in all the important moments uh, until the death. And the same way, uh, when someone uh, dies traditionally in our classic society, the body will be wrapped in an indigo dyed fabric to be buried because we do believe that it's a celestial color and it will help the dead body to go to the other world. So, you know, it's not, of course, my commitment to it is at several levels. Of course, uh, I don't want uh, this tradition to die because uh, losing that is losing our soul, but it's definitely because it's connected to our ancestor. And something I did not say, and I have to say here, even the name of the plant, the indigo plant called the Galairi, the, the, in our cosmology, cosmology, God is called Mangala, Gala. And it means Mangala Bairi. It means a divine tree. So, and uh, it's completely, it, it exists from the beginning of our, our, our own existence even. So, and it's very, very important. Yes, Indigo is definitely for me and all my, my process, my art is definitely spiritual. And then even I, I come to say, oh, the work I'm doing, uh, accessories or garments, when I say that my textile are therapeutic textile, people say, oh, how? But you have to prove that scientifically. And something I have to say, my grandmother and my ancestor have been using that for centuries, I mean, for always, is uh, even the garment we, we wear, dyed with uh, indigo or other, other plant, is used as a bandage for a human body. Because... You know, the fiber, when it's dyed in, the, in, the, in a plant dye or in indigo, is, su is supposed to, by the human wearing the, this uh, garment on his skin, is supposed to transfer the, 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 how can I say, the healing purpose, the therapeutic purpose on the skin of the human who is wearing it. So we use garments not as a fashion, as something fashionable, but as bandage for a human body to both protect and heal. So this is a part of our ancestor belief, and, and I do, you know, believe um, in that two hundred percent. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing all of these um, wonderful thoughts with us, and and that that is so interesting to hear uh, everything you've spoken. I think we've just been uh, really treated tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, Abba Bakar. Very special so evening, I think, for all of us. Um, I also would like to thank everyone at the Tapestry Workshop who's worked to put this lecture together. Please visit the website to learn more about the Australian Tapestry Workshop. And if you can visit, it is the most wonderful place, uh, I think, in Melbourne. 
uh, and there will be other talks and exhibitions. Uh, Abba Bakar, thank you again yeah, for thank really you so much. being. Thank you for having me, and I will definitely come and visit you also in a few months because I'm, I'm planning to come to Australia for your summer, January and February, to run workshops in Melbourne. I mean, uh, Heltham. Heltham is uh, near Melbourne, I think, in, uh, at this place called the Lothing Waters. And uh, I, I would definitely love to, to come and, and visit your, your place again for a second time. And um, I'm really looking forward. And thank you, everyone, for your interest um, to my work and for being part of this conversation. And of course, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. It's our greatest pleasure. Good night. Thank you, Abba Bakar, again. Wonderful evening. And thank you to all of those who've joined us from all around the world. And before we go, we have Nam in Melbourne, uh, Unseeded Wongoland in Sydney, Liverpool, UK, Rabibi in Broome, Eltham, Gadigal country in Sydney, uh, What Are Wrong, uh, Nim Nimbi Nimbin, and Kuana Adelaide. So, and a lovely comment before we leave, your collaboration with other species is just beautiful. So uh, I think good night to everyone. It's been a super evening. Thanks, Abba Bakan. Thank you everyone for joining in. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.